Well, let's hope it works. Oh, listen to that. Jesus, it sounds good. <laughs> oh, so I've deliberately um, I've deliberately brought you in here, Alexander, for this next episode. <laughs> and I've deliberately brought you in here and not told you anything. That's I realize true. there's no That's topics. <laughs> and I didn't tell you any topics or anything because um, for this episode, it's like I just wanted to know. I realize I don't know all these stories about your life because this is the i mean this is the comedy guy podcast and i i know a lot of interesting people but i often don't know like what's the angle what to talk to them about and what you know what what could they kind of have to say but when i think about you i think this this guy when i start adding it up he's a true renaissance man this guy has how did he get to do it so if i'm i'm getting it right all the things that i believe that you do so far so you're a trained lawyer. Yes. Okay. Number one, you that means that you also then teach at university yes. as well. Okay. So we got some sort of university professorship, some sort of lect- lecturer kind of thing. Okay. Good. Uh, what else then? You also are a comedian. Yes. You're doing comedy. Yeah, That's right. That. You are well known for being a bouncer. That's and true. You've done that for many years, and you're well respected in your field of security. Well, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> and you run a you know small business that's around true. providing those yeah. services. Yeah. That's more than enough for any one person. Have I missed anything? Is there something else? And I'm a school teacher in addition to that as well. And a school teacher. What yeah. level of school teacher? Tenth grade. Hmm. I mean, is that just sort of some classes that you have every week or something that you yeah. go and teach? Okay. Yeah. And what are you what are you teaching those children? I teach logic and the fundamentals of law. Logic. And the fundamentals of law. Because I was about to be like, oh, he teaches them logic. Interesting. I like that. Very old school, very Greek style philosophy. I'm getting down with that, teaching yeah. logic. And you're like, oh, and the fundamentals of law. Is Are they separate or logic as it pertains to the fundamentals no, of law? two separate courses. Okay. Oh, are they two? Oh, they're two separate courses. Yeah. Right. So you teach. So logic, this is extremely fascinating for a stupid, small town Australian kid like myself, that logic is a discrete course that is taught. Is it all Estonian schools have something like this? No, it's uh, it was an idea by a former minister of education, Mr. Avikso, who has oh. now moved back to the academia. That It was uh, his distinct idea that if the school would st- schools would start teach logic as a separate course, then uh, it somehow would, uh, I guess, the, raise the, the quality of argumentation of students, which is not that far-fetched from the idea, but it's not meant as a mandatory course. It's up to a school to pick if they want to teach it as an mm-hmm. elective or not. But the school where I work, they kind of <laughs> took it to the next level. So all 10th graders have to go through me. That's tremendous. What school is that that you work for? Uh, it's the Old Town Educational Collegium, the VHK in the Old Town on Venice Street. Okay. I love it. I love that that's a thing because like, oh, dude, in Australia, we're stupid, right? We're so, we don't get, I mean, notwithstanding that we're not learning languages. Like in Australia at high school, if you're learning a language, it's like, whoa, wow, the person learning the language. And maybe it's a, a well-known one or something like that. Like mm. it's, the, you know, it's the, you're learning French. Wow. German. Wow. Like there ain't nothing obscure. So even the idea that there could be something that's because logic isn't a marketable skill. It's not a like directly. No, no, absolutely not. But it, it does enhance your uh, ability to present your marketable skills. Mm. So that's that's what I do in my class. I mainly concentrate on the uh, argumentation and the idea of presenting your thoughts. Right. Well, of course, some good old classic. Uh, connections to mathematics but uh, my my colleagues in the mathematics department got that one covered so yeah. so that's what i mainly do with them talk about the idea of how expressing yourself coherently sort of raises you especially in the in the era of social media where where the question of uh, well, like now we everybody's sort of sitting in a quarantine or should be sitting in at home and the the biggest problem now is that how to get people to sort of separate between the fact-based information about the virus and anything that somebody on a pedagogy forum might have come up <laughs> with while they're too bored. That's crit- the, the, the critical thinking is what you're, Basically, yeah. you're getting across yeah. there. And 
Do you think these students respond to it? Well, I hope so. Yeah, I guess you got to say yes right now. No, nah, they're all stupid pieces of shit. Okay, we can't really say this. I understand. No, I, I guess it's it's more about the the, the diff. Well, of course, they, they respond to it in a, in a different level. Mm. But at least what I try to do is get the sort of fundamentals to them. This is something I know that all of them at least manage. But then how much they're going to take away, that's rather hard to say. I mean, it's just like with, with any kind of class. I mean, like in college, mm. that you might go through the class you get the grade in the end and the best that I as a instructor can hope for is that the things that somebody answered correctly is going to stay with them and the ones that they did not answer correctly <laughs> after providing them with the feedback, maybe they're going to remember it. If not, well, you know, tough kick. <laughs> Is it? Is it? It's a. It's not like a boys or girls only. It's all mixed, and there's yep. there's different genders yeah, yeah. in there. Is there any like how do you, do you see some differences in the way that, that that young women and young men respond to this, or is it because it also this is like? Am I going to guess this is a what to say? Um, more fancy school, for lack of a better term. Well, yeah, right? this is not public. Like, I mean, when I say like Australians are stupid pieces of shit, I mean like I went to a public school, like very public in the countryside, small town, isol- hundred, no, yeah, maybe a hundred kilometers away from the nearest high school, maybe sixty, let's say, from the nearest one. Like, uh, yeah, we were rough. But okay, we're dealing with that's a this is a better school, right? Well, yeah, it's it's, oh, it's the public school technically speaking, but mm. it's among on the list of the so called elite schools as they keep it. I this is one of the lists I always loved ever since I was a kid in high school myself, because mm. my parents would go mental whenever the once a year the whatever top hundred of the or top fifty of the schools would come out, and then we'd be like losing their mind ape shit. Like, ah, what number is your school? I'm like, I don't know why. Mm. I didn't check. I don't really care in that sense. But it's weird how that stuff used to matter. Um, things like, oh, how is our school doing? Or I don't know. Do you have this? Like in in Australia, we have and, and still kind of had and have this thing like a, a university entry mark that essentially, like, I got a score out of one hundred and everything. Your whole friggin' 12 years of education and growth and adolescence gets boiled down to one number between zero and 100 and you're mostly on the 50% side like you got to be really bad do like that and so much gets put into this one number like the end of school and that's your rank and you've got to have a high enough rank to get into this particular course notwithstanding that one student might be better suited for one type of course pairing. No, it's all just basically a popularity contest. Oh, yeah. Sure. And it's still, we don't have one mark. Yeah, okay, they, that's good. They have the five exams at the end of the high school you have to take. <sighs> so three of them are sort of dictated by the, the government. Everybody has to take them. The Estonian language one, which uh, used to be a, a long kind of essay you had to write. Now it's a a compilation of grammar and a short essay, which uh, well, and, and next year it's going to be a collection of TikTok articles. I guess like, that's so. Where yeah, it's going. that's where we're yeah. going. Yeah. <laughs> then there's uh, math, and then there's a, a language exam, if I'm not mistaken, the, oh. either English or then German or French, whatever it is that you you've studied. Mm. In addition to that, too, you can pick yourself from anything. But the logic is that for the purposes of getting into college. You want to go and study biology? You better do your biology exam in high school. So that's tremendous. There was when I went through, there was no connection. You just got the score, mm-hmm. and if if you wanted to be in law or be a doctor, you just had to have a mega high score, and you had no choice. Same was back in the day in Estonia. Yeah. So when I graduated from high school, you you did your exams, but when going to college, that was only basically mark whether or not you could take to sit on the exams for the. Uh, study field you chose mm. or not so but now yeah it's kind of dictates whether or not you have chance at all or yeah. if that then yes that you want to do study medicine you better have high scores because this like don't know days i guess the number one uh popul- in popularity contest in college everybody wants to be in business oh that's it absolutely is it? yes oh, okay. everybody wants to make you know money and mm-hmm. be successful ceos of something or other 
usually it's somebody wants to replace Sir Richard Branson or something mm. without actually having any clue about what it is that yeah. Sir Richard and then be does like, on a daily basis. Bro, you live in Estonia. Why, if you're so motivated to be the businessman, why are you wasting four years at university? <laughs> Dude, just go register the business and go do it. There's enough startups, pitches, Absolutely. fucking incubators out there. Dude, you're four years behind the game, sure. Like, learn it as you go if you're that motivated mm-hmm. for it. And with the, the basically the electronic registration system of a business in Estonia, <laughs> it's like 50 minutes if you have your paper, like even less than that. Mm. To submit all of that, you have your paperwork like up to 15 minutes, you pay your fee and then just wait for the court clerk to <laughs> give you a green light that great success. I think there's that. not that there's not that same spirit of entrepreneurship in Australia. I guess it's a, maybe it's a bigger country thing. Uh, the way the culture evolved differently, that Australians were still focused on, okay, maybe I'm going to be the doctor, the lawyer, the I'm going to study this particular thing at university. The the concept of running your own business and entrepreneurship, I think is still like a weird, still something that feels abstract to them, where in Estonia, it feels like the most natural thing. Sure, of course, of course, this fucking 15 year old is running his own business on the side, you know, like that's mm. so normal here and almost expected. Um, when I was going through my computer science degree, like the, we had, I don't know, some assignment and then the two students who got the best mark, they got a job doing like one project and we were like, whoa, wow, they've really, they got one real thing. Like we couldn't, there was no connection between our computer science degree and the industry back then. And now, and I still think it's like, I don't know, it's just different in Australia, big country, more conservative. But here it's just like, go for it. Go, 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 go. Why are you sitting around not making money? Go, go study that. Yeah, well, I I guess so with the the small country, it's the the amount of examples per person, basically, essentially Mm -hmm. speaking, is already bigger, I guess. Well, even the the amount of startups and successes, like in the end, I mean, we can joke about it all we want, but for every Estonian where there is a chance to say that Skype was made in Estonia, (laughs) they're going to take it. (laughs) Even if, I mean, even if that's the only thing they know about (laughs) Skype in general, they're like still going to point it out (laughs) every chance they get that this is from Estonia. I get it. uh, Any any other... uh, starts up they might come up with again they say this is estonian even if again if you ask them what it is that the particular company that does they're like i don't know but it's estonian it's sort of this pride moment which is not that bad and yeah that's true that I've, um, last year i went around some uh, high schools associated with my lectureship at the business school and gave some talks about the idea of sort of how the law affects business mm-hmm. and it was to me also rather cool to see that there were already so many like 10 or 12 11th graders like mm. kids in high school basically back back in my time we were in high school the only thing we were basically concerned with was not to freaking drop out because <laughs> mom is gonna have a heart attack and dad is gonna kill us <laughs> so we just kind of went with the flow if somebody came up like you know should we register a business or you're nuts you know, we oh, don't yeah. have time for that like chill you know we we have something else to do whatever it might be but no time for that but nowadays there's interest there's though there's different business clubs and whatever the programs directed at school students which on a, on a grand scale of things what i think i love about it is the fact that it maybe gets the idea of sort of how the economic cycle as such works into the heads of people earlier on mm-hmm. otherwise it's um, sometimes well we we might end up with uh, with a person who like really wants to go into business, but if it's the only understanding is that you know once I succeed, if once I succeed, I'm gonna succeed every time. Mm. Sort of like what I've witnessed as a bouncer in the last ten years in event organizing, which sometimes the people who want to organize an event, their, their understanding is like I'm gonna make a Facebook event. All my friends are gonna come. They're gonna spend shitloads of money. <laughs> everybody's going to be rich. Mm. And then when the day comes, you know, the reality kicks in that you have to pay the rent, you have to pay the DJ. Everybody, I, Not everybody who clicked interested or going uh, actually yes. showed up. Uh, out of those who do show up, not everybody are there to pay. They're more like, hey, dude, you know, we came for your event. Mm. You know, what kind of, why should we pay for a ticket? You know, we're old mates. And then you see them being in this classic situation of like, I, need money to pay certain <laughs> bills but i also you know, want to keep some kind of a social level friendship with those guys 
Mm. And so in the end, it's like the, the money calculator is not there. Yeah. Like to, to, there's no spine to say that, if, you know, if you're going to go in for free and your 10 friends are going to go in for free, I'm losing 11 tickets, which means that for 11 tickets, I could pay, I don't know, a DJ yeah. or a bar staff. <laughs> and then when, when after the, the sort of the event ends and you're there like, hey, where's my seller? Like, oh, well, yeah, we didn't do as well as we expected. Not my problem. Yeah, right, buddy. No, See, no, no. And this is this is sort of the thing that with, on on there's a, the colleague of mine who works for a bank always says that he's very happy that well he's talking to his kids about economics already even though they're in a the kindergarten right. obviously like no charts on the wall but <laughs> but sort of the same logic that you know if I give you like an apple for lunch and you eat it at breakfast and can be freaking starving during the lunch but it's a tough kick yeah same with the managing the resources so I guess this having a lot of opportunities to do uh, different projects as you said different incubators hubs mm. like even with the, the same social media that all those TED talks and whatnot that you can get to the, the podcasts the videos which are obviously a, a good forum to learn and find out but sometimes like when I think about a couple of my logic class then sometimes it's uh, interesting to notice that uh if you ask, if I ask my students to find something online, then it's usually that the less hip it is, the, the longer time it takes. And sort of, if I would like to, but if I would tell them that list me the Kardashian sisters no, by it. name, starting with the oldest or the youngest, it's a couple of clicks and somebody is already there. But if I would like ask them to <laughs> google when aristotle was born for, just for giggles it's gonna take a bit longer for them to like somebody might go to the wikipedia but then it's the question of how do you spell aristotle <laughs> which again this is an educational moment but sort of thinking about the information it's mm. uh, i guess from the point of view of education i always think that how to connect with uh, like as, as you asked that if we, who are smarter boys or girls then it's mm. I, I think it, it's not that much about the, the subject it's about a topic mm. or that the amount of interest and well from purely psychological point of view men are usually lazier that's not much we can right about, because i know. was in this case i wasn't specifically asking who's smarter i was like who seems to just click with these ideas oh, in that sense. first yeah girls, yeah. girls. okay yep. all right this makes sense yep. okay because eventually, that I would imagine. That, well, I don't know my dumb stereotypes is the boys eventually go like, "Yes, I this is I am the man. I do the logical things." But at the, when you're young and stupid and in high school, and or the testosterone is just kicking yeah. in for the first time, and you want to yell and scream, and you're going bananas because that girl next to you just grew breasts overnight, and you can't. Something in, deep inside of you is screaming, "Oh God! Oh God!" <laughs> like, yeah, there's no, there's no logic, and you find out that there's no explanation in Aristotle's textbook. Damn it! What's going to happen? But, but yeah, I get with the, with the clinking. It's it's sometimes not even just a question of who clicks faster but it's again how to sort of combine is usually i've well my, my practical experience shows that there's usually more girls in the classroom than boys mm. so it's kind of uh, finding the common grounds <laughs> sometimes rather difficult i remember once slate uh, put it rather nicely to me that you know alex try to talk to them about literature i like, there's one what? small problem with that i don't read what they read I mean, <laughs> it's not that i don't know what to say about literature but like i haven't read twilight i haven't seen the movies i mean i i'm rather dumb when it comes to harry potter and stuff <laughs> like that so bringing in examples from literature for me usually it's like i think about something and then there's a my part of my brain saying that dude I'm more than certain they have not yet read <laughs> James Joyce's Ulysses. So that's not <laughs> going to be an appropriate example. So it's uh, usually always thank you because thanks to social media, there's always or well, like Twitter, for example. Mm. Some of them follow it, not all of them, but basically <laughs> keeping an eye on Twitter kind of gives it, okay, at least to me know. sometimes give, gives them examples of what might be the discussion. And not not always very useful discussions sure. for tend to create classroom. I mean, if most of the Twitter is sometimes filled with either people wanting to get laid or being too distressed with too much people asking them. Fifty percent of Estonian Twitter is Ari Mati Mustin and trying to get laid. Exactly. Like that's yeah, and the second fifty percent <laughs> is the is the people trying to figure out why. The other fifty percent is girls trying to get yeah, laid. Exactly. With him. So <laughs> at some point, you know, I'm like, so maybe it's not really what 
<laughs> we should bring up at the moment. Uh, but yeah, with, with, with clicking, it usually shows that the girls kind of catch on. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't say faster, but sort of the, the ideas are carried over. Hmm. Whereas it's, again, with, with the examples, like certain examples, I might direct like more specifically at boys than I have to. Be prepared that like sixty percent of the class will want a separate example <laughs> to connect with that. Though of course sometimes it's also the problem since I'm not big on following too much sports. Okay. Then um, I've been avoiding different uh, soccer analogies lately because everything. Oh yeah, but you know in that club. I'm like, oh damn it. <laughs> okay, that was the step I was not prepared to take because <laughs> like I don't know the list of clubs or who plays where. I know that the game exists. <laughs> Let's see what's gonna happen. But nevertheless, you still make it work, which is how long have you taught in the high school now? 10 years. 10 years. Jesus. I think we need to, uh, first of all, I, I think we need to go back a little bit here and lay some groundwork a little bit. How old are you? 35. 35. Okay. So I'm still older than you. That's all right. That's true. I'm 40. So, yeah. okay. I'll just, but that, that's not bad. I mean, that's 10 years of teaching in a, in a high school. So, and as I, as I understand, we don't have to go too deep in, but I understand you are married. No, I'm not. No, you're not married. No, I'm not. No, you have a partner though, right? No, I don't. No, you don't? No. Okay, that bit I didn't know. Okay, that bit I didn't understand. Oh, okay. I thought you... This makes more sense now because I was trying to piece together the story of Alexander Popov. For some reason, I got it in your my mind that you had a wife. I don't know. Like you had a wife and a part or at least a partner. But then I was like, this is what half the thing I wanted this podcast. I'm like, why have we never seen this woman? It's like, where the <laughs> fuck is she? I was like really convinced that you had a partner. And I'm like, no one's ever like, who is this? Is this, is it a Russian thing? Does she just stay at home? Is that what they, okay. Now we're pulling it together no, a little bit more. And single. Okay. No, it's fine. No, bro. I have Look. graduated from my mom's couch to my own apartment though. So it's a good I, step. Yeah. I'm very happy. Look, I'm 40 and single. It's fine. You don't have <laughs> yeah, to. Well. <laughs> unmarried. You don't have to. All right. Now we got that. So you've done that. Um, yeah. So where does it of, at what age did you start bouncing and, and being security? Well, um, unofficially when I was 15 at the high school parties when I, when I went to high school. Okay. So unofficially when I, at my first year in the uni. Like some house parties, it was always back then. It was like, uh, pop yeah, well, the fucker. school parties in the school or the house, but there was a mm. lot of different stuff going on in the early 2000s, late 90s oh, in yeah. Estonia. That's, let's put it that way. Historical times as my <laughs> time, or as my 10th grade is usually telling me that at my age, Talking about history is more like an ontology of your life than actually talking about <laughs> historical events, which I'm always very happy to hear from them, which is true. I'm 20 years older than they are. <laughs> so, mm. But yeah, it's about 15, 16. And then when I went to college the, for the first year, um, sort of, I went to work for a security company, which was a, a dull, officially talking a very dull work because due to the lack of official experience, I was assigned to work uh, security in a furniture store. Ooh, which was very was, exciting. Okay, it was very happening. exciting. The whole weekends from 10 a.m. till something like 8 or 9 p.m., I would just stand in a furniture store, look at people trying to pick up furniture and kind of make sure that they will not make out with the closet of the door, which would not, the closet would not fit through. But mm. I was there with some kind of money, something to have for yourself. And it, well, I mean, I was living at home, so okay. no major costs. And you were like, fuck it, this is a job. I don't care. I'm getting money well, for it. It basically was know. for me yeah, to have some kind of uh, money of my own in mm -hmm. the sense that... Uh, with the salary I made, I paid for my my karate lessons and my my bus ticket back then. Public transportation was not free, and whatever small change was left, mm. since most of my time I either spent working or studying, and in in the karate dojo, then the on rare occasion I would have a spare evening that's like once a month pub thing very uh, uncommon to what came later in my student life once but, a month you can go out wow yeah, okay exactly that's... very very fascinating but yeah. and back, back then there was a cool party called hip hop cafe so it was something that was usually plan into my schedule that like once a month this is something hip hop cafe where was that at Hollywood 
Oh, at Hollywood. Okay, nice. Well, back back in good old days, it was they had the rule in the Hollywood that you could only get in in the shoes, which meant that if you went for it, even like the, the hip hop party, everybody had sneakers in their backpacks because you had well, you had huh. to have shoes on. Yeah, right. So, of course, so you had you, to have. Oh, so they still had the rule. You had to like the polished black shoes yeah, yeah, or something, yeah, yeah. some formal shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as oh, soon as you got a trip to the toilet, <laughs> sneakers on, shoes in the backpack. That's so the, one of the toughest challenges before getting drunk. Don't forget you have to change back into the shoes yeah right but, uh, yeah so what okay so back then so what that way what year are we putting this out again now about 2003 now? 2003 yeah so you get you've got a little bit of money you can go out very occasionally you're doing a little bit of bouncing work 2003 mm. so that's 17 years ago yep. so that makes you 18 Something like this? Have you graduated high school? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I graduated in 2003 in spring. Okay, so, so you just was, ended high yeah, school. Yeah, I was 19 then. Yeah. 19, just ended. Mm -hmm. you starting to do a little bit of bouncer work. You think if I can just work at the furniture store, then I get maybe the resume, you know, build mm -hmm. up that. Um, wait, so, and, and then there was that night at, at Hollywood. What, back then, 2003, what were the clubs? Where were we going out in Thailand in 2003? Well, I, I guess... Hollywood back then was one mm. of the the most prominent. Uh, yeah. A lot of parties there. There was the the legendary Bon Bon, which uh, not to be confused with the strip club next to Hollywood. No, it's not the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> no, the name is the same. Uh, they were in uh, the the area of Rotterdam back then. Okay, now it's it's step. I believe it's uh, a restaurant or something. Okay, but it's uh, on the Merapuesta. So, but that was more of the you needed to have some serious dough to get in, mm. or well, at least to spend there. So it was mainly, I guess, uh, was Privé happening? Yeah, Privé was happening. Privé was, was, was open okay. in two thousand and one. Yeah, Privé was. Uh, there's Décolleté back then. <laughs> Décolleté. Which, yeah, now it's Panorama. It's uh, near the World Trade Center, Tallinn. Okay. Yeah. So, well. And but mostly then there was also a lot of action going in the league. There still is the pubs that have their bands, but nowadays it's uh, like, oh, unless it's here Bobby or something, but mm. it's not that big of an event. But it's, okay, and, so. and house parties were still cool. Yeah, okay, that was still a thing. Again, yeah. yeah, I guess so. Well, yeah, because we're not allowed to meet. We're gonna. <laughs> Underground, well, we're if, back if, to that if, now. If the October 1st is going to come and the new regulations and selling of booze are going to enter into force oh, in yeah. Tallinn. How's that going to go? So it's 2003. We've got a few clubs. You're starting to... When does... Um, because after a while then, you're not working at the furniture store anymore. You're getting, you know, some legit jobs either mm. in, in nighttime events or something like that. What's that? Does it just sort of start to happen? The company you're working for is like, all right, we need someone, Alexander. No, actually it's... Um it happened after I got out of the military service because after the year working for a, oh yeah, yeah good in, in a furniture store, mm. uh, I got uh, and I switched professions for a while. I went to work for a bowling club. I got a good offer, so I worked mm. in Kulzal. It's still there. Oh no shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kulzal. I was uh, technically my job was to be the mechanic and instructor on bowling. <laughs> First one, okay, we kind of got that one. When it came to the instructions, back in the day. The, the sort of professional bowling leagues just were getting started in Estonia, so yeah. there was a very small amount of players. But nowadays, it's like a very popular hobby, as I recently found out. So I, I spent some time in Kulzal. Then I went to do my uh, internship because uh, it was one of the part, one of the re necessary requirements in order to be even to graduate from the law school to do an internship, which was classically, of course, by the time everybody else had found the internship, I was like, God oh, damn it, you know, I have to submit the papers of where I'm going to go be interning like next week, okay, we have to do something. And I remember a friend of mine, she got an internship with Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she said, there might be some places left. So I basically sent an email that could you help a student out and they were like yeah sure why not you know so i went did my internship in the ministry of foreign affairs mm. after that i had a summer off after a while just well doing some odd jobs here and there and then the, the last year of undergraduate studies i uh, i got a job with a friend's company of helping him with legal documentation though my official title was an in-house lawyer which was ridiculously stupid because <laughs> Being on a third year of law school, yeah, you're basically learning the rows, but mainly I was. And you're not a lawyer yet. Not a lawyer <laughs> yet. <laughs> but 
back in the day earning 5,000 a month was <laughs> a like great salary. Mm. And well, it, it was a good practice in a sense that it kind of put me in a position where I had to get practice smart real quick. Not just that, yes, you know, I went to classes, I read my textbooks, which mostly was like, I was reading textbooks and I wonder how that would look in real life. But then the situation was that you never knew when you had to actually do it mm. at work. So I would consult with my dad, who was also had a law degree and stuff like that. And in that sense, it helped me because I remember my business law exam, um, which uh, I did not attend like not a single class because <laughs> I was working. <laughs> And uh, I remember the, the, on the day of the exam, my course mate is calling me up. He's like, you're coming to the exam? I'm like, what exam? I'm like, dude, business law, 20 minutes. Get your ass over here. You want to graduate or not? I'm like, yeah, actually, yeah, I do. And then my first idea is like, how am I supposed to pass a freaking class? Yeah. <laughs> Which I've never attended. And I, I grabbed the business code from my table. My boss is like, where the hell are you going? I'm to the exam. I'm like, what exam is that? Business law. I was like, okay, you better not fail. <laughs> We've been paying you. For <laughs> I did not fail, so which is the practical part. I aced because you've been doing the practical. Yeah, is that I've it? done it. Yeah. For me, the problem was that it started with like theoretical questions, uh, which sort of brought me back to the first year in legal theory. I was like, okay, yeah. I read the question. I answered the ones which I kind of got the idea. If I like, it was something which I had no clue about. Like, I'm just not going to answer. Why should I bullshit? I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with myself. I'm going to spare the poor guy grading this stuff. Ten pages of nothing. I got through the exam. <laughs> my my teacher was very amused. He was like, I've never seen you in any of my classes. And how did you manage to pass? So I told him the story. He's like, oh, okay. Good. But, you know, you should go and brush up on the theory. I was like, yep. Makes I'm going to go get the textbook from the <laughs> library now. <laughs> but, yeah. Huh. So... So you're in this time, you are, you're studying law, you're doing some of this, and you're bouncing in the evenings as well. This mm. is nonstop, bro. Like, you have such a punishing schedule to yourself, even when you're young. You know, like, was it the- You must have got some enjoyment out of the bouncing. It's not just a job. Yeah, I've been heard that. Yeah, no, that's true. At some point, it, it became more than a job, I guess. I, I wouldn't say that it's- uh, it's a lifestyle, but at, yeah. at certain points, yeah, because I, I found that there was something that I was good at, mainly due to my sexy, appealing looks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there was also something that kind of posed the challenge, which I think it still does. Though, of course, with the, with the progress of time, it's the, the 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 standards have changed. I'm not necessarily saying in a good way, but uh, though, back, I mean, but remember when I started on the door, even in the, in, in the school party. Back in the day, the, the logic was that the first time they put me on a door was because we had a party and the Russian school found out about it. That was those good old days <laughs> where uh, the differences based on language or <laughs> sets out of yeah. different venues. And um, the, the guys organizing the school party knew that I'm fluent in both languages, Estonian and Russian which meant that I had a better chance of at least sort of keeping them at bay of not rushing into the <laughs> auditorium <laughs> and kicking someone's ass than somebody who doesn't speak Russian. Sure. So, and that's how it began. And after a while, it was something I was known for and I was good at, so I was yeah. like, why not? And yeah, during the college, at some point it got a bit crazy in a sense that, well, it's not just studying and doing all that stuff, but it kind of got to a point where my question was like how about trying to do something else? like mm. seeing what's out there so I, I always think that when i when i when i went to the army i was i guess 11 months of more or less peace and quiet in a sense that <laughs> was that the but some parts of it were to me rather boring because just sort of like now sitting at home i'm not used to it so yeah. it's, it's, there was the same i mean i know i cannot leave the territory but in the army, the logic is you cannot just wander around the military base. Sure, you got to say that. Yeah, you know, you, you have this part. You, you you better have a reason to, mm. to go somewhere. So sitting around like, okay. But you mentioned the the challenge of the job. Mm. I mean, we can all imagine a hundred challenges there might be, but for you, what was the challenge and what was the skill that you got better at over time of working the door? 
communicating with people, I guess. Because I mean, usually the 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 classic idea, well, I've encountered the countless times people usually when they hear a bouncer they go you like violence you go there to to hurt people mm. i don't like why i'm good at it but i'm, probably, I'm not <laughs> enjoying it tremendously and about hurting no it's it's not the point i mean otherwise i would be out of business for long i would be in jail mm. that would be something i would do constantly yeah but that's sort of the thing because it's it's not always well yes it's about establishing the rules mm. yes it's about making sure that people stay in line but it's also about communication, sort of trying to foresee what might be the problem or to communicate to the people that what it is that that's going to happen, sort of that mm. the, the toughest is to kind of pick out those who maybe should not be allowed in this particular evening because it's, it's better for everybody else. Because there's always, there are those people who uh, take nightlife as a sort of a battleground for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Never understood them, but th- th- there seems to be a, a portion of that that kind of uh, mentality in the population. But when it when it comes to communication, then it's yeah, it's not just about saying you know when we open, when we close. But I mean, when I started, to me it was like uh, you know why should I know some things? Nowadays, it's quite the opposite. I'm like if if I, for example, visit a venue and and I ask a bouncer on the door that hey you know who's performing tonight and they're like i don't know mm. then to me the question was like okay but what's the purpose of you here there oh okay that that's some okay it's uh, to do the best job to have yeah. the most context absolutely I mean, it's not just a public service no, no. to be able to say who's on the lineup tonight, yeah, yeah. but who's are the bands and the acts that are coming on, yeah. I guess would give you some hint about the type of person that you expect to come along Absolutely. as well. So you can mentally prepare for, okay, this is the poetry reading <laughs> with the furniture store. We're going to be fine. Yeah. Or this is the hardcore, I don't know, intense heavy metal rap. I don't know yeah. what the fuck, uh, you know, drunken party of the year. That and we're it's gonna also to from the point for. of view of the people who who come to ask who's performing. It's usually, especially like when when it gets to draw the pricey tickets or even with the venue. Hmm. I remember I was <clears throat> used to work in a rock cafe, which uh, by its name oh, indicates yeah. it's a rock party. But during the, the two years I worked, the majority of the events had nothing to do with rock. Hmm. Or metal. We, we we had raves or I don't know, classic music concerts or poet readings. And there would be people coming up like, Hey, it's it's it's, it's a rock club. You know, like, well, technically, yes, but tonight uh, But we, rock rock club, rock cafe, that's the one up the top near Sikupili, right? Isn't it? Oh, yeah, no, they moved, but now they're in Ulam is the city, but they used oh, to be on the, okay. on the hill. Yeah. Right, on the hill there. Yeah. yeah. But like if you're just walking along and you're like, hey, what the fuck is going on? Like, were people just walking around Sukapuli, like walking around up the hill there? Yeah, sometimes. Huh, okay. I mean, like, I wouldn't imagine that. Well, it's not not people compared are. to the city center where you could usually, like in, in Privé yeah. back in the day, it was usual thing. Okay. People yeah. would pass by and like, hey, what, what's going on tonight? And at some point, I, I kind of realized that I have to be able to at least contextualize to them what's going on because it's going to prevent well, two problems number one if they buy a ticket they don't like it then mm. they're going to have words with me which i can basically prevent by sort of explaining to them that sort of what, what i understand is happening so they at least can decide for themselves should they pay for a ticket or not mm. and secondly it will i guess leave and people with the with the emotion that it's uh it's it's come up well, it's not a problem to ask for information because mm-hmm. I mean, just standing there with this the, the stone face, like I don't know, was, what are you third grade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's good. I like that. I like that you take that that extra effort. I, I'm trying to recall back to my experiences with Club Privé because for me, I mean, because we started the the stand up comedy there. We didn't start. Sorry, it was the first venue beyond Drink Bar. We first started the stand-up comedy in Estonia, standing on the coffee table at Drink Bar in uh, you know, an old town there. And uh, that worked really well because back then it was like super unknown and no one knew about it and it was super hip. So there was a super great crossover between if you liked craft beer 
And if you were into this stand-up comedy thing or you'd heard of it and they were both really new and like underground then. And it was a, a fantastic crossover between James Ramsden and I that um, his craft beer crowd also happened to be the crowd that had a little bit more money, maybe a slightly bit international, so knew about what a better beer might be. So then we're more likely to know what the stand-up comedy is and that really worked for us. And then eventually we couldn't, we had to, find somewhere else to do the comedy shows like we're like okay let's do a bigger show this is going really well and we still want we still did the drink bar but we're like we'll make a second show and we didn't know what the fuck we we're doing we didn't know about theaters we didn't know how to rent a space i had no contacts i didn't know anything and kuno decided to give us the shot at Privé. And we didn't know nothing. Like we, I was like, I'm, I'm a bit now like, why the fuck did we do this? But we did it just because we didn't know. I was a little bit, because I was so naive to the situation. I was like, oh, it's a nice club. And, you know, it's they've got a stage and lights and I don't have to do much. Just bring some chairs in and it'll be done. And it was a very mixed experience for me. Um, it was very interesting to see behind the scenes of a nightclub back then. And uh, like kind of the last golden age of club. I kind of feel like I caught the like the last days of disco. Like I just caught the very tail end of seeing what an old school club might have been. Something you would have seen throughout your years. I, I just sort of got a glimpse of it behind the scenes in the last days. Um, uh, and in the end, I mean, the the comedy kind of worked there for a bit because we it it. Um, we inadvertently tapped into the idea that Estonians think that the theatre is a fancy place to go and so the comedy is a fancy place to go and so for a certain number of people would come to Club Privé to see the show because it fit the thing like oh the performance, the talking, fancy, Privé, it, it fit. And then it took us a while to work out that no, 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 actually stand-up comedy is the opposite. It should be in the dingy bar. It should be in the low grade. You know, it's not a fancy thing. And we understood that while we were pretty much filling up Privé, um, there was a lot of people that wouldn't come because they wouldn't go to Club Privé because they, they that wasn't a place they would go for whatever. And then I started to learn a lot about how people perceive venues and a lot of, if you have... If you say Lucy K is in, I don't know, Club Privé tonight, of course that will fill up, right? But if you say, hey, I got two young comedians, they're trying their thing and they're going to test it out, it's in Club Privé, people go like, I'm not going Club Privé, mm -hmm. not for those guys. You got to find that venue that's compatible with people. So it was very interesting to see those final days and the way Kuno wanted to sell beers for like whatever it was. I think it was euros then already. So like five euros for a fucking Carlsberg or Heineken or whatever. And I'm we're like, no. And then we learned about how people buy beers and all that stuff. But I will say I do have to, to give my props. Um, one very positive. There were some negatives out of that experience. But one very much positive in the end was learning and, and working with the manager, not uh, Kuno was the owner, but uh, Enard Essensen was the manager then. And he taught me a lot. I really owe Enard uh, a huge, he taught me a lot. He's a hard guy. He is a very precise man. He ran Privé and he was doing all the graphic design, a lot of the ideas. He is very knowledgeable about the music and the clubs and the DJs. And he has a fine taste. He knows what's up and he knows what's good and what's that. And he has a very high standard and everything in the club had to be to his standard. And it was tough sometimes to work with him because he insisted on that extremely high standard that Privé was known for, or at least back in the day. But, and at times that was frustrating, but with time I can reflect and see that he, what he taught us, Eric and I doing stand up comedy with Lewis and Eric there, like the, I learned a lot from him and the way how precise he was, the vision that he had. Um, I mean, he's a tough guy. Like one time, I think we used to have the musicians. Like, so we still used to have we still have DJs sometimes come to the shows. Um, I think Sanders tour has has got uh, a DJ coming. But we used to have like the live music even then, like a three piece. It was pretty cool. 
like having a three piece band play before the the stand up. And I think the band, the band arrived late, like maybe like 30 minutes before they had to be on. And NR just walked to the stage and went, leave. And he said, that's it. No. Nah. And he just fuck it. They went and they, and the band, like you guys, you had the warning last time. You still came late. Go. And just told them to get fucked. And I went, okay, cool. Let's work for me to have to set up the band. All right. And yeah, like you could see when- when he crossed that line, it was like, uh, and now whether he's too hard, whatever, I'm not, I just learned so much from him. And I think without talking about too many details, because I don't want to speak too negatively about that, seeing the decline of the nightclub industry in general from behind the scenes, I think, was also interesting as well, a little fraction of that to see them try and how it's going and now we're in a different place. So anyway, no, it was I, interesting for me, yeah. I, I had sort of uh, some similar experiences, maybe from a bit of a different angle, but mm. but also like when I when I started the nightclub, the Privé was the first nightclub I actually kind of bounced at. Yeah, okay. And that was where I learned my ropes and also from and among other people and after that whenever i would switch a venue or even now when i go for a venue there's always something like the same when when i when i see that there's not enough this risk demand for some kind of standards then i, I kind of have the same thing with <laughs> I automatically the first thing i think is like fuck i miss pre ray yeah right yeah, because had, yep. back then yeah. you knew that if if you like you do what you're expected to do, mm-hmm. the thing is gonna work. Like you, for me, as, as a bouncer later on, as a as the head of security there, I knew that I don't have to worry about everything else. As long as I keep my end mm-hmm. in check, others will do the same, and it's it's gonna come out as a good party. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's this there might be some technical glitches. Well, life is an unpredictable thing. Once we had a, there was a live in Privé, a reggae band from the US, the Dread Days, I believe they were called. <laughs> and uh, it, it was kind of a, a prearranged thing, but it, it, it wasn't a long planned thing. It was more of a spontaneous. And I remember I was sitting in, in front of the Privé. They had the stereo lounge back then at the bottom level, now where the Hugo Boss star, I believe, still is. And I was just sitting there. Uh, drink. I had this sort of a routine that I would show up uh, an hour or so earlier, drink tea, and so crossword puzzles <laughs> to you know, set myself in the mood of the street. And, mm-hmm. and I saw like a group of people like, trying relentlessly to get into the door, which is locked. And I, and I go up to them, I'm like, why are you doing that? The, the club is closed, they're going to open at 11. They go, oh, we're supposed to have a sound check. I'm like, well, <laughs> what? And th- there was uh, a lady with them, uh, their manager, Estonian. She said that, well, you know, we, we are performing tonight. And even it was supposed to be a, the party itself was a, a legendary ice cream party with the DJ Defcat, or as the bouncers usually call it, ice cream for help. But... Uh, Oh, it's a great party, but it was usually the toughest one. A lot of people, very popular. Mm. And, well, I, I sent a message to, to the DJ. He's like, well, yeah, I heard something, but, you know, I haven't invited them to talk to the club. I get in touch with the club, and they're like, well, yeah, our sound technician's supposed to be there. I'm like, I haven't seen the guy. I've been <laughs> here for an hour. Like, what do you mean he's not there? That's exactly what I said. And it ended up with us... I basically, I let them in. Uh, DJ who organized the party was um, setting something up at the, or picking stuff up from his previous party from Hollywood. So he runs from Hollywood to Privé. Mm-hmm. We relocate the DJ booth from the big stage to the to the, the small booth mm. because of the live performance. I mean, like, we'll look at the clock. Like, we have 40 minutes before <laughs> the doors are going to be opened. And that was sort of the experience that you get while dragging that stuff. Uh, we have the guys from the reggae band who don't have anything with them. They're like, their logic was, that, oh, but we were told that all the technique, well, all we need is here in the club. Uh. 
Sure, somewhere yeah, in exactly. the club. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, well, I don't know. You know, you do the music. I'm, I'm, I'm on the door. I don't uh, know what it is. It it ended up with, uh, well, being, how should I put it, a, a memor- memorable performance from the point of view of <laughs> dragging all of that stuff. But they, they kind of had a CD with, with their music, so... Uh, which DJ played and they tried to perform <laughs> because there was no time for them yeah. to even like rehearse that. <laughs> it was something out of the Corley band experience in a sense that it, it looked like it was the first time on stage <laughs> and literally, well, most of the people were like, okay, well, it's interesting, <laughs> but why is it here? Yeah. <laughs> like Of all of the places where they could have done it sort of the same downstairs on a te- uh, downstairs outside on a terrace on waterblown for example would have been cool would have been fitting mm-hmm. but then to, during the r&b party like the people are gathering for 90 minutes there's music the party is going on and then it's like okay music <laughs> off now on stage whatever 15 minutes there's this awkward high school party silence nobody knows what's gonna happen next other like midgets running on, <laughs> on a stage or like why these guys what are they talking about mm. so yeah that's the, the experiences which which now and i think that so much is going on again that maybe not so much in the clubs but the, the venues that rent space whenever there's somebody is putting up a party I, I always have this laugh that when I when I go to do a gig, I'm like, okay, let's see how it's going to be this time. Because it, what, what I find funny is that it has become, well, I would say hip to think that everybody is doing something new, even though actually what they're doing is rediscovering something that was very hip 20 years ago. Yeah, it's all this time. Exactly. Yeah. But for them, it's like, well, I'm... In 1920, the, back yeah. then when they maybe some of them were just born or not even born. Now they organize a party. They think I had this great idea, <laughs> and I listen to that idea. I'm like, well, it's been done before. No, yes, <laughs> no. I'm not gonna go into that argument. <laughs> I can bring a couple of examples, but it's the, 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 the my favorite favorite memory with Priya was about how we lost a cow. A cow. Yeah. It, well, thankfully, it wasn't the real cow. It would have been even funnier. But yeah. there was a, a party, a farm-style party, mm-hmm. which was like the, 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 the stage was full of uh, hay and stuff. And <laughs> the guys who organized the party had rented decorations from either Russian theater or uh, Estonia theater, one of those. And among those decorations was a huge cow, <laughs> uh, which did not fit on the stage. Well, it would have fitted on the stage, but then the DJs would have stand like cramped <laughs> in a corner. So they decided that for a purposes of not, not showing the cow, they relocated the bloody thing from the upstairs to the downstairs. So they literally <laughs> they put the, the cow on the Hario Street. And back then you could drive a car through Hario oh, Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was before the, yeah, the, 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 the all the square. monuments and that. But back when it was just a parking lot in front of Kafik Moskva. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we were like, okay, cow in front of the whatever. You know, but st- people doing things they know, they are the artists. And uh, the party was over and we had like closed down the doors and everything. And the guy we had on the door had also come up and we, we literally we freaking forgot about the cow yeah. because we we're like, okay, cow, whatnot. We, we, the party was over. We're like, okay, nobody got hurt. Everybody's alive. And at some point, um, Rina from the office comes and she's like, guys, where's the cow? And we're like, what cow? <laughs> oh, shit. The cow? And we go outside and it's missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not there. And i like, I look at the guy. His name was Gleb. I'm like, Gleb, when you were leaving, was the cow there? And he's like, I have no fucking clue. You know, I forgot about the cow. I'm like, yeah, I can see that. And you're like, okay, um, not good. Mm. Because it, the, the problem was in the fact that since, you know, they... It was a rented thing. <laughs> then the, the guys were like, it's not that much about the money, but it literally like the, the Murphy's Law, that it was the one thing that the theater really needed back. They were ah, like, it's, yeah. it's a pain in the ass to remake it. Yeah. So, you know, we, we're going to rent it to you, but we need it back in one piece. And we were like, ah, oh, hmm. shit. And no Facebook yet. Uh, good old Orkut. Oh. <sighs> Loving it. Connecting Brazilian Brazilian guys with blonde Estonian women. Absolutely. And <laughs> and it ended with us, well, 
posting like on Orkut saying that, you know, if anybody has seen a cow and God in heavens, next day I get a call from an old classmate of mine who was at the party yeah. the day before. And he's like, Alex, I read your post. I actually saw guys like dragging a cow <laughs> down the street on Muriwa. I'm like, when did you see that? Like, in the morning when I was leaving. Mm. We were like, great. Do you maybe like have a clue? <laughs> well, that, okay, Muriwa. So spreading the info. And by the evening, we, we had finally gotten information. There was a, friend of a friend of an organizer's friend uh -huh. classic estonia like everybody either knows a member of rigago is related to one <laughs> and we got information that yes some guys decided it would be very funny to steal a cow uh, it turned out that the, the guys who organized the party also knew them so <laughs> it was sort of the prank which went in that sense terribly wrong because the cow was supposed to be back in the theater next evening. It wasn't there. Yeah. The money, the clock was ticking. The theater was like, you know, we're going to give you like 48 hours. If you're not going to find the bloody thing, you will have to pay us penalties plus for the cow. <laughs> so th the poor guys who organized cow the penalty. cow penalty. Yeah. And the guys who organized the party realized that this is going to be like the last event they ever organized because yeah. they're about to go bankrupt and start selling kidneys for a cow. Yeah. But we got the cow back. Um, good for us uh farm life was saved uh though so, oh yeah they, they managed to damage one leg but we kind of got that one squared away <laughs> the the artistic community uh, supporting the guys organized came together so they did patch the cow up and since it was like <laughs> the hinge leg or something that the lady in the theater was like okay at least you know we got the cow back <laughs> but now even then it, it was like ridiculously funny as a situation yeah. Okay. It would have been worse if it would have been a real cow, but, uh, but, but to think about that time, it was, I believe it was 2007, 2008, something like that. For an, a group of young guys, you know, try to sort of take a next step from just DJing to event organizing, and a, party, organizing yeah. a party. For them, that was an apocalypse. They were like, I better going to have zombie apocalypse or something. But this, like, you don't have any monetary safety net because how could you? Yeah. This is one of the things which, well, might one say you should foresee, but on the other, like the sad thing of that is that later it really turned out that the guys who dragged the cow, like, when I talked to them, like, what, why did you need the freaking thing? I mean, if, if you wanted to have, they were like, we wanted to have an after party with a cow. I mean, you could have just, you know, called. <laughs> And borrowed the cow. Yeah. All you had to do is just let people know. No, it's more funny that way. I'm like, I doubt that the three guys were almost having like the early onset heart attack. Yeah. Well, because they were literally sitting there and like they, they counted the money they had made from the party minus what the club took, uh, minus what it's, uh, <laughs> well, the theater would have taken. And they were like, okay, you know, wait, there's no way in hell. Even if we're going to borrow from friends and family, that even if we're going to pay to the theater, how yeah. are we going to supposed to pay it back? Because there's nothing to organize a next party with. Neither would you want to organize no. after that. I mean, if you, if you go so much under. And that's like, the risks you take as the venue organizer, as the event organizer. But I, look, I, when we're at university, we stole a lot of shit. Like we stole lots of shit when we were at university. We were young Australian kids growing up in the countryside. We weren't from the city. We we're in like a reasonable city, Newcastle, technically still bigger than the country of Estonia, but you know, sure. Fucking it's a small, it's a reasonable country town for Australia, Newcastle. We're gone. We're living out the back of the university. Maybe something like where Tita U is right now, living out there, living in a, four of us, living in a house. We could walk there when we needed new knives and forks. We would steal them from the kiosk there at the university when we get our lunch. And we love stealing street signs. Dude, we, our house was full of street signs. Like when the car would go down the street and the headlights would just shine across the house, our house would light up like a disco ball. Like ding. We had, my friend was a DJ. He had three milk crates with a huge street sign that had his decks on it. We had 
everything that we were even, and it was just something, it was like instinctual in us, in little Australian kids, like, no, we're going to go steal some street signs. We never stole from a store. This wasn't like criminal. In our mind, this is not criminal activity. We weren't stealing from a store. This was an organized crime or we weren't stealing from a place you could buy something. To us, it was like those street signs have been left on the street. They have not been bolted down. They have not been chained down. It's our God-given duty to go and steal them and we loved it fuck we couldn't the first days of one of our friends it was the first days of mobile phones and one of our friends had like a kind of fancy job or working in some tourism thing so he had a phone and my dad happened to have a phone like in the car like car phone and i would take my father's car for a drive, go and pick up my friends. And then I would like drop them off. They would undo all the street signs on one corner. And then I, they would call me on, he would call me on the car phone. And then I would come back around the corner. We would put all the street signs into my father's large car and then take off and then go stash them at someone's house. Like we loved it. If there was, uh, it was just, and then not only do you want to take the street signs off, a street, yeah, maybe unbolt it from or something. Um, we we then put our minds to greater topics. Like, well, what if it's in a pole? Like, there's a pole in a ground with a street. Like, how do you get rid of it? And then, being the being the students of history that we were, we were like, let's do a Saddam drag. And like the, I mean, maybe you could have the same communist example that when you invade the country, you want to tear down the statue of great dictator and you tie it to some tanks and the tanks pull the statue down. And about that time was when America was going and we're watching these videos of America going into Iraq Mm -hmm. and these huge statues of uh, these Humvees and tanks pulling over a statue of Saddam. And we were like, this gives us a really good idea. So (laughs) we get my blue Mazda 323 and we go down the end of the street and we put one rope around the end of the street sign, the other one around the front of my car and we just ripped the fucking whole pole out of the ground. Now, now the question is, what the fuck do we do with this? <laughs> what are we going to do? At first, we drag the whole thing back, but then you've got this pole, this metal pole with concrete on the end of it when really all we wanted was the sign at the top and we were developing advanced techniques for how to to, to steal. There was uh, in that same place that we lived at, there was a big park just across the road, actually quite a lot, really long park. The park was so large across the road that we were hitting golf balls off our front yard into the park. It still probably wasn't the best idea, but it was still something we did. And we took home a shopping trolley like a full metal shopping trolley. And we didn't know what to do with it once we got it home. So then we strung it up in the tree, these big ass trees. And and it's got to be, I don't know how the fuck we got the rope over. I think Adam may have climbed up a good 10 to 15 meters in the air. Adam climbs over. We get the rope over there. We tie the shopping trolley and we basically hoist the shopping trolley up into the tree and we tie it and the shopping trolley hangs from the tree for the entire neighborhood to see directly out the front of our house. Like we're not even subtle (laughs) about what we're doing. Again, not high crime, right? Just Australian pranks. This is what we do. And police never came around. No one, like, this is not hard to implicate us. Like, there's old people up and down the street and then one house full of four university students, which a shopping trolley happens to be hanging in a tree out the front. I guess, I guess who the fuck may have done that? Gee, it's sending Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and not only could we observe our handicraft of looking for a couple of weeks this shopping trolley was up the tree, But then one day the council decides they want to get it down. And so they bring like a lift, like a cherry picker, like that raised platform thing. And that's on like wheels and it's got the lift and the stand for the guy to go up. But this park wasn't a flat park. It was like a park that sloped downwards. So they had to kind of get the 
the, the machine down there and then they got the machine stuck because it was dirt and a bit wet and they couldn't pull it back out again and they couldn't get it up and the whole time we are sitting across the street on deck chairs at the front of our apartment drinking beer watching them having the time of our lives laughing at the council trying to get our shopping trolley down no one ever came around so look I, and because I guess for us because to us, in our naivety, that was a victimless crime. Mm. That was the council, the, ca- the the whatever, the city government had to do it, right? Yes, yeah, some guys. Now, a little bit later, I can appreciate, okay, some poor motherfuckers had to- His day was shit because he had to do that. But in our mind, that didn't- We were just like, what? Council's paying his wage? What? He's getting a job? That's going to go do it? Like- we justified it because we were just like, yeah, that's what we do in Australia. We steal shit all the time. But the cow, fair enough, because there's some poor guys who don't have money and they've lost the cow. No, I mean, for, for the guys who took the cow, the, the logic was sort of the same. I yeah. mean, not, nothing happened. Like Nobody well, got killed. Dude, I'm going to steal like, the yeah, cow. Yeah, Fuck it. Yeah. The cow is here and, you know, you want it back, you get it back. It's, it's sort of that. that we stole terms. a bee. We went, uh, Adam and Dieter and I went for a road trip to the north of Queensland and there was like a honey farm there and it was called Super Bee. And at the front of the Super Bee was a big, at least like a kind of two meters by a meter wide, like kind of really thick wood cut out of the bee. That was their mascot. And for some reason, like we went there, I don't know why we went there, the fucking bee farm. What a, like, I don't know why we're- we, okay, I know why we're going because it's an Australian road trip and you've got to go to all the tacky places. So we go to the fucking bee farm. We're like, okay, this is great. I'm so on the way out. I'm like, I just, I go, guys, wait here. I walk up to the sign and I was, I kind of rock it back and forth. It's on a big wooden, one big wooden stake in the ground, a big thick thing, this massive wooden sign. And I'm like, Dita, this is going to come out. Bring the car around. And so, Dita drives around. We've got my mother's station wagon. I might add at this stage, how old are we? 22. Uh, no, no, maybe 21. We're at like 20, 21 at this stage. We're not 16. And we rip the sign out of the ground, stick it in the back of my mother's station wagon and drive south of the border into New South Wales. Somehow thinking that we wouldn't get caught. And yeah, we made it like no one. We just drove south for eight hours and never fucking came back. And we got that sign. And that same place that I talked about with the shopping trolley, we just literally put it on our front lawn. <laughs> like we were, we were a thousand kilometers away from where we took it. So we just left it on our front lawn as a sign. And uh, um, when I when I put up the description of this episode, I'm going to post. I still have this picture of Dieter and I. Like we stopped in some back road and we got, we had tools because of course we do because we're delinquent Australian children and we were undoing the bolts from the sign so we could get rid of the big wooden pole on the back and just keep the B. Oh, oh I love that shit. God, it was possession. Like just mm, must steal more street signs. Oh, oh dang. I'll put a photo up with the, the description of Dieter and I doing that. I think we left that bee on our front lawn for for ages. And then it was gone one day. Someone stole it. And we found out. And then I don't know who it was, but I think we eventually kind of worked out that it was like someone who wasn't a fan of one of our housemates. They stole it. And then it was like it got full- Hostage negotiation, they sent back one of the antennas of the bee. They snapped off the antenna of the bee and left it in our letterbox. And we were like, you motherfuckers, I don't know who you are, but I will find you and get my motherfucking bee back. And they did. They eventually broke up the bee and smashed it and left it on our front lawn. And we were like, oh, I never, I never found out who it was in the end. It's rough in Australia, all right? Yeah, That's what we do. It's right, rough. Get it. It's how we go. Especially to the bees. Mm. And the wood. Uh, so anyway, so the bee, the the, the cow in Privé. So <laughs> I'm going to try and loop this story back around to where we actually were before I go off and ranting about what juvenile delinquents we are in Australia for 10 minutes. Um. Yeah, man. How do you think- um, 
so let's say back then, even before I was in Privé, even because that was even 2010 or 2011, right? And so you're working even earlier than that, like in the golden age, you know, what I, I don't know, I'll make this up. I'll fuck it. I'll go with it. Let's say the golden age of clubs and going out and they were popular and that was a place to be. What do you think of the differences in the nightlife between then and now and in Thailand specifically? Well, back then it was, um, since the, the, there was, I would say, certain clubs were more popular than they are now. So it was always the clubs that, certain parties even, it wasn't that much about the clubs specifically mm. maybe, but about the events that were happening. Like for me, like Hip Hop Cafe in Hollywood still remembered the event. Ice cream in Privé, we always knew it's going to be full. There was some other parties like that here and there in the city, which they, in different formats, certain events still have this vibe. But back then, I guess it was more settled on the fact that it was less running around. If, if nowadays we, there's so many things happening at once that mm -hmm. it's for some like going out, it's a bit like a trip. Like there's those people, oh, many people think that I'm going to go first there and then I'm going to have like a half an hour here and half an hour there, which in the end you end up with kind of realization that, uh, well, even if I'm on the list in all of those places and I don't have to pay, the pure time that it takes to move around different venues is just wasted instead of maybe like picking a party and an after party or, mm. or starting first uh, in, in, in a bar or something. So you think there's many more play there's many more events going on? Yeah, well, on. because nowadays it's not just that much about the clubs or the pubs. But it's like people renting spaces to organize yeah. venues. Uh, oh, even in in Teleski, like during the the, the, the springtime, summertime, there's, uh, there's plenty of stuff to sit around. Which which I see uh, the the shift from old town towards mm. Teleski already for the last I would say five years. Definitely. Where the the question is that well, on on one side here you can sit around on, on a terrace, relax, play some music in the background. Uh, without having the problem of the the old town, which which back then w was smaller, because since people stayed within the the confines of a bar, oh, unless it was Surgara, Surgara has always been yeah, okay. shit, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the street itself, the, the, it's not that much the bars, but I guess well with the bars there comes the the crowd and the, the always gets to that, but it was less of the problem from the point of view of too much noise or like nowadays the, the logic is like, you know, if we're going to stop selling liquor earlier, the only thing that's going to happen, they're going to be on the streets earlier yeah, and longer yeah. in a sense that uh, the, the shift has been from the point that it's, uh, there's more choices. The prices obviously have gone up, which mm. means that the, the question of going out for a party, it, it always kind of settles with the, 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 pre-drink somewhere like 10 years ago 13 years ago it was very rare to see that people would stand in a queue with with the, the bottle and sharing it hmm. which obviously it happened somewhere right somebody had a house party hmm. or or they would go like when on Hario the, the good old Hario Hill before the monument they would go up and sit on the stairs or on the bench hmm. which was cool but now it's it's more about like trying to make it to the club at the peak of the party, which uh, usually shows that when <clears throat> the events start or the club opens. Mm. 10 years ago, it was rather normal that people started coming in rather early on. So that as soon as you open the club, already somebody would, in a matter of 10, 15 minutes, there would be somebody in so that mm. you the next sort of bunch of people coming, the classic question is, is there anybody there? Which on one hand you might say, well, but yeah, you know, yeah, we have a DJ and a staff. Which I always found this question funny when it's it's a group of people. We're like, how many people are there? And I'm like, okay, how many more do you need? Yeah. yeah. Or the second one, if it's if it's a couple, it's like a guy with a girl, it's like, are there anybody else? And who else do you need? <laughs> I presume you're okay. If it's single guys, yeah, sure. <laughs> or, or single ladies, same thing. Like, is there anybody there? Okay, I got it. You might want to have some interaction. Yeah. But that was said of the, 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 it would fill up. The party would kick off by like midnight, maybe a bit after midnight and starting 2 a.m., 3 a.m. 
people would start kind of mm-hmm. packing up, depending mm-hmm. on the party, of course. But nowadays, it's uh, before one o'clock. It's and dead. The, yeah. And that by the time it's sort of packed, actually, we are reaching the time of end of the event. Yeah. Which, uh, <clears throat> of course, brings about the question that uh, how do you, well, what to do? Like the first two hours on, on the side of the, the staff, well, well, if there's nobody there, nobody there. But then when, when people come in, the, again, the classic question is that when, when I, for example, go to work in a, a gig, you have planned that I have a gig from 11 p.m. till, let's say, 4 a.m., and then there's nobody till 1 a.m., and it's like, oh, you know, we're thinking about doing it till 5. Uh, yeah, yeah, That yeah. doesn't really work that way. I mean, we I kind of plan. Sure. All so, the staff yeah, have to go home. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, because you, you've counted in that to your time frame. Yeah. You Even if, like, even if I don't have any, like, special plans for the morning, that's kind of, again, the, the, for me, it's the question of the mindset. Yeah. And, uh, just prolonging it... Again, brings the question, but how far are you going to prolong it? Because mm. it's not just the staff. It's again, if, if you rent a venue, you've planned specific amount of time. You, you pay for an amount of time. And how did you not know this, bro? How are you doing events in Tallinn and you don't know that shit now peaks at 2 a.m. exactly when you thought you would close? <laughs> like, really? You didn't? Yeah, well, but, but the, and this is the second thing that I noticed that it's kind of the. Since with with the not just social media, but the, the idea now, at least what in, in my opinion, is, I'm not saying that there is some kind of a t- tough training you have to undergo to organize it. But just like you mm-hmm. described, I mean, if the in, in at the time where the, the ten years ago it, it was harder to to organize an event mm. because if you didn't have any contacts and nobody would like let you in like yeah you, you might have had the best idea in the whole city about throwing a party but if there was nobody to listen to to hear you out with that idea to become a bridge between you and a venue that was all it stayed it was an idea nowadays basically all you need is uh, I don't know uh, rent an apartment like the Russian guys who wanted yeah. to film porn videos, right? <laughs> they said, "Oh yeah, we like whatever they called it, but you know, people rented them their apartments, and then That's found it. out online that oh, honey, uh, we are here in Madeira in the on vacation, and meanwhile Nadia is taking positions on your favorite couch." <laughs> Which for the guys who organized <laughs> the business, they, okay, now they've moved, but for the time being, uh, they made their money. Yeah. But, but same is sort of with the event. That you, you, you rent a venue, it, it, it's shifted, it's now it's wider. Not just thanks to places like Teliskivi or Boitik uh, and Kopli, so on and so forth. But just the logic of it, it's not just that much about like going clubbing, but... We can have a, a good DJ playing in Pudel and people will come to have a beer and listen to the music because they might enjoy the performance of the man. It's like the mindset is larger. Like you said, mm-hmm. back in the day, we sort of just went to the old town and that's it. Yeah. And I remember, I even remember going to the place that uh, is, a, um, Henrik does the show there, is a factory now that's a Christina. Heli de has now. Heli it used to be factory. It used to be Uber Blingen and Heli de has. Uber Blingen. I went yeah. there once when it was Uber Blingen. And uh, yeah, like even that was like, whoa, so far out. Who would ever think to come to such an event? And now it's like, yeah, totally legit. I don't know if Henrik so even then- has a second thought about is that, you know, if someone wants to go. Now I wonder, is that. Um, Yes, that's a social thing. Yes, the old town has changed. Yes, things have grown like Teleskivi and all that. I wonder if it's also slightly affected that it is like 10 times easier to get a taxi these days. Oh, absolutely. You bolt, boom, yeah. I can be drunk. I fucking just mash my phone and some guy will drive me home and I, it's not a, I don't have to pay him. That's got to make moving between clubs like- no, absolutely not just that. Easier. It's the transportation. Mm. It, it's the, just like you said, also the mindset of the fact that it is okay to sort of look for the parties in the places where, which are not clubs. Yeah. Like 10 mm. years ago, 15 years ago, when I went to college, everybody was like, I remember studying in uh, in the Institute of Law of the University of Tartu, which uh, oh, the, 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 now it's just a faculty of law. It's still located on Karli Buyasta. And back in the day, as a young student, one thing I never understood was that 
this place is now closed down completely as a cafe. It used first it was Moskva, then it was Vabados, but during when mm. it was Kofik Moskva, is some kind of a social thing. I'm like, you know, you have to go there. I'm like, what's so special about it? Well, you know, it's a cafe. I mean, yeah, I get it. It's a cafe. That's my point. And mm. if it's just, a, I've been to a cafe. Like, I mean, it, it, if, is it the D cafe or is it, if it's just a cafe, I have like six next to my house. Yeah. All right. Why should I on my day off? If you want to go to the cafe, why should I bother taking a bus from Krestira <laughs> to Kofik Moskva if I can like walk 50 meters from my house, go to the cafe, go back home? Well, I'm sad. But nowadays it's the same thing. That it's not that that connected to a specific place. Mm. Now the logic is that yes, we have clubs, we have bars, we have venues that where people organize parties. We you can get just the app, but it's not sitting online anymore. Like the taxi dispatcher and hoping to God <laughs> that not just that you get a cab, but like nowadays, well, even nowadays, the, the options are, the more options, it's easier to travel because back in a, even today, if you want to get like taxi from city center to, I don't know, Numa, for example. Hmm. On a weekend night, it's gonna take you a while till somebody respond, responds because still the logic and is you know I don't want to go out of this oh, city okay. center perimeter. Even I live in Mustama. Sometimes <laughs> you wait for a cab, you try and try and try till somebody on board like picks up. And but then, the boat don't get to see your destination, do they? I so, thought they don't get to see your destination. Have I just destroyed your argument here? No, no, I just, I, I, I'm not, I not thought, certain, but at least I've, I've gotten this argument from the drivers that oh, I, mean, I have to drive okay. to Mustama. I'm like, well. Because I've yeah. got in and the guy's like, oh, wait. And you can see him do yeah, well, the app I, and I he's like, that, to and then no, he goes, oh, yeah. okay, now I've got to drive you but there. But it might be just like, I know that with Uber, the logic is they cannot see the destination before they arrive to pick you up. And yeah. then it shows where you need to Maybe drive. that's it. Or maybe it yeah. says like, how just the how far you have to drive or something yeah. maybe it gives them something like yo so this, I think this next trip's gonna yeah. be about 30 minutes do you really want to take but, that but maybe no apparently. i think they, they still see the address where they have to go okay so the, the difference here would be that you know back in back in the day becoming a taxi driver you had to know the city map right. by heart so at least you know the logic that it's if it's like lino there it's like shit here we go like christina yeah. or something or if it if it was somewhere in like meliko oh last night man. Huh. <laughs> who would want to go there but, but still, of course, due to the fact that you, you can look and now sharing your ride once again is easier. Like with, with the apps yeah. back in the day, who has cash? Nah, like, dude, like yeah. Where can you take coins, out cash? Yeah. Having the money, like no, like if you didn't have any cash, classic walking back from a, from a party that sort of also put mm. it on you, like, you know, I'm a student. How much money do I have? How much do I want to spend? So. I want to go to the club, but how are we going to get back all this? It's easier when I have to pay the cash because it just comes that three euros, four euros just comes off your card. Like, you know, especially after a couple and, of links. Exactly. Yeah, and, and you think, it. again, the, the money to sort of yeah. the, the money cal calculator in your brain is more at ease because they're like, okay, you know, it's the card is connected and your brain is okay. You know, your card is connected. You don't have to think about the pin codes. You don't have to make mm. sure that the money is with you. All you have to do is like charge the battery on your phone. Yeah. That's it. And then even if it like happens that you buy arrival to the destination, it turns out you don't have enough money on your card, then well, you can run from the cab, I guess, once <laughs> you're there or something's never changed then. No, certainly not. But and then this is when it comes to organizing the events, I guess mm. it, it makes it that much easier because we can back in the day, yeah. if you wanted to organize an event somewhere outside of the sort of the club circle, mm. one of the things you had to afford was how the hell are people gonna get there? Mm. Can taxis back then when on Hardy, the Hardy Street was open for traffic? It was a great time for Club Premier because you could get a car like straight in yeah. front of the club. It was better than Hollywood. You yeah, didn't have to there. walk. It was straight in front of the door, very like in the movies. Yeah. Now, if you uh, go to Hario Street, well, there's the bus station, <laughs> which is not that big of a walk. 
But again, the, I guess the downside is back in the day, you're like, you called the dispatch, mm. dispatch, you told where you are, they kind of figure it out. Now, <laughs> if you're drunk, have fun playing with, the, with the green thing on the app. You can get closer maybe to Hollywood if you go to Surakaria than. Yeah, I, but know, nowadays the taxi in the night, they cannot drive to Surakaria. There's the limits on that again, you know, oh, accessibility right. of taxis. Okay. So it's uh, the. The Mustputka, the Black Burger booth, has become the place next to the church. Very religious. Across <laughs> the street from the school. I have a lot of questions about that. Who oh, the what? tree, the, the school that's it's got the pillars that look like a tree. The English College, it. yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And there's that kiosk. Mm -hmm. The Black that's Kiosk. There. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's the one. Which is a legendary place if you want to like... Still get the good old classic 90s burger with uh, a twist. Not that much rats in it anymore, though. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a, something brilliant happened on uh, Sorkaria, which was that uh, Circle K took over the venue of the old Taco Express that's been 20,000 million different establishments. Each of them, mm -hmm. like nothing has been able to be consistent and stay there and not have health violations Absolutely. in that in that place on circuit with ours. And it's like, no one could make, it's almost like cursed by this stage. Like we would all like, whenever it was the then Taco Express, I forget what it was before that. And then we were like, ah, I'm also, ah, Taco is the last I remember. Yeah, After that, before that, I'm- Same. Same place, same kitchen, that, nah. Yeah. And it's like Circle K, brilliant. That's the only thing you could put there. Because if it was going to be another takeaway, nah. It's oh, no, just gonna no, not going to break no. the curse. No, no. I remember Taco, actually worked at Taco Express for a while. Yeah? Well, yeah. at the door, I'd yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it'd, get, it'd get crazy. The, the, the gla glamorous uh, <laughs> job of uh, guarding other people's food, which paid well, though. And and that that was the truth because it, it got crazy as soon as the like everybody who were thrown yeah. out of anywhere else. Well, there's a reason why the gutter is right in mm. front of the the door. And B, of course, when when the place was full in the morning, it was like mental. They, they did well, but of course, again, the question was that <laughs> only place I've ever seen people get into a fist fight over a food, literally. And that was the, like one of those places where it was the, the, the comedy of the thing was that there was a, a guy who had just come in to the pizza place and he was British and he's like, why do the pizza, why would a pizza place need a bouncer? <laughs> and right after he finished the yeah. sentence, one guy just smile, pa punches the other guy, guy over the table into the face. I'm like, <laughs> well, be right back. <laughs> We settled, we, we throw them out, like, did it answer your question? Like, yep, got it. <laughs> Which reminded me of when I moved to Finland after, after my military service to do my masters at Helsinki. Then my <laughs> first experience with, with nightlife was that back in the, oh, it still is, but the, I, I lived in a dorm which was outside of Helsinki city center. So for me, it was a, Jesus, 40 minute bus drive every morning, which was cool. You could read your book. And I was going home after a party and decided to grab some burgers from McDonald's on a road. The night bus would leave like once an hour or something. And I remember going to McDonald's and seeing like bouncer on a door when well, wearing a stab proof vest and stuff. And I was like, it's 2007. I'm in Finland. The, what, ha like, what happened during the 11 months I was in the military service? Like, what, have the burgers become somehow like more expensive than oil or something? And literally, as soon as I got into the McDonald's near the railway station in Helsinki, mm -hmm. I saw a fight broke, break out over who should get the order first, even yeah. though like the, there were grown men pushing and kicking each other and the, the girls, boys and girls working in the kitchen were like, there's 500 cheeseburgers like <laughs> right here on, on the counter. You can see them. There's a huge pile. Everybody's going to get one. Like, or you two. saw you fat fucks coming. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, guys. Like, <laughs> we, we are ready. And there's like a ton of fries. Like, nobody is going to have to wait very long. <laughs> and I was just standing there looking at the bouncer. And he looks at me and says something in Finnish, which, which I kind of understand. But back then, not able to respond and finish. And I'm like, same thing. Like, I don't understand you. Like, welcome to Helsinki. I'm like, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you need. I'm like, all right, great. Uh, um, I had, I lived in Finland for a year. I think it would have been 2009, I want to say, maybe, or 
I think the year before I moved to Estonia. So the year before we started Comedy Estonia. So maybe 2009, let's say. And yeah, I mean, going to that same, the McDonald's on the main street there. And I understood Finnish drinking culture when it was like 2 a.m. And I go to get a burger. And I I walk up the, like kind of there. And inside, I'm about to walk up to the counter. And there's a dude just passed out on the floor. Like he's just passed the fuck out on the McDonald's so floor. Finished. And everyone is just stepping over him. Like no problems. Like, don't worry. Hey, oh, that's Yossi. Yossi had a little bit too much to drink tonight. No problem. Yet it happened to all of us. And everyone just steps over Yossi and gets their order without worrying the fuck about like, yeah. he, he is okay. Hey, no, it happened to all of us. Huh. Uh, <laughs> Well, it, it, stuff like that can sometimes be seen in, wow. in this neck of the woods, though b- rarer, but still, I guess in Estonia, with Estonian drinking, that's where I'm with Ari, might have to, <laughs> he made this bit, but when, they, when he and me kind of came back from Barcelona, there's a, there's a difference. Like when Estonians, we do not surrender until we literally like pass out, even though like, y- y- your body is screaming, like, get the fuck home. <laughs> like, that's enough. <laughs> they're still always like in, in the club. Th- th- one of the differences, again, like 10 years ago, nobody would. Well, there would be very few people who would, after the, the party was over and the lights were on, would still like stack up at the bar like, hey, you know, <laughs> could we get a last call after last call? And you'd be like, no, you know, the club is closed. Bye-bye. Yeah. But now it's it's like this classic. You could, like, they're like, oh, we, we need just one more. You're almost passed out. You're going to have one more tequila. You're going to be my problem on this floor. I don't need that. Yeah. Like, and and still, it's uh, nowadays. I guess it, it's moved from like getting to town, like at a decent hour, maybe like sort of first going to a pub, getting getting a dinner, having some couple of beers, then going to club, going home. And I was like, I get to the town by one a.m., I get smashed by four, and then start to look for the after party places where I could sit till like nine a.m. and then. Pass and you you out think the that's cab. because of uh, the rising cost? overall because well, when i was living in i guess costs as well but but at least i remember 10 in 2010 when the so-called good old previous economic crisis hit then that was one thing that could say that people would which has gotten better that less people get too smashed at home that they would not get into the club but it's still sort of you now a step back 2009 2010 was a menace it would usually the people would well angry Mm. there's a people who somebody lost a job like going to difficult times and people would be angry in general they would get drunk and they would can literally get you would get people behind the door who are there to kind of relieve themselves of anger and there you are and you're like great here we go fantastic you're i had, I had that other perspective on that because around that time and that's when we started comedy estonia so 2009 i was living in finland so let's say 2008 2007 is when i was living in sweden and i was still over there and I noticed then, like, and I hear what you're saying, that that's how the culture changed. But comparatively, Scandinavia was still very different in that yeah, they had that bear, they were much further down that line. So they were very much, you go to the house party, you get really, really drunk. And then, like you say, you show up at the nightclub at 1 a.m., have one expensive drink, and you stay for two hours, and yeah. then you're gone. And that was super strong with those guys. So while I believe you when you say that, mm. relatively, Talon had that. To me, Talon even then still had the idea of, oh, we can go out and, and do that. But I, I kind of- it makes logical sense to me that as Estonia is getting there with that same feeling that you're more likely to stay at home, more likely to drink. Because mm-hmm. back in the day when the drinks were so cheap, when it was, I mean, I guess we had less money back then as well. So it's a bit, no, 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 no. I'm not, look, I'm not the economist here. But yeah, that was super strong back then in, in Scandinavia. And mm-hmm. now that culture has come to our nightlife well we wanted to be scandinavian world. country under the leadership of andrew zainzi but <laughs> we sort of are not really in the i guess not in a way he foresaw it but mm. that's true that's well, now going to the club it, it well, obviously prices go up but at some point if like you calculate mm. in you pay for a ticket you'll pay for the drinks then it's it's not that you're not planning it anymore like yes i'm gonna go get there like by 11.30 and I'm going to stick around oh till 3 a.m. Yeah. No. Right. 
It, it's more, I guess, now about depends on the venue as well. I guess. Mm-hmm. But, but with clubs, it's uh, some clubs have gone that way, like the the, the former of a bank, which is now safe, I believe. Is it? Oh fuck! Is it called? So it's not the bank anymore. No, okay. no, no. And now they do that that every weekend they have a live performance. So it's basically to get people in for the mm. live. And after that, somebody sticks around. Well, certain amount of them obviously sticks around after that as well. But that's where you kind of you you put the effort on having this live performance, get the maximum of people in. That makes uh, sure. Which I guess Pri- Privé did that back in the day. They yeah, had absolutely. A fair amount yeah, of live yeah, yeah. Sure. stuff as well. Because that's one thing that always struck me. Maybe now I'm a bit more hardened after ten years of running Comedy Estonia and ten years of promoting events. But back then I was a bit like dang you got to do an event friday saturday and then you wake up monday and you got to turn around and start promoting next friday next saturday and it never stops it just yep. you know we can have a little break we can have a week off just do an open mic we don't have to jump up and down about that show but dang as a club you have to be bringing the heat Absolutely. every single weekend that is a lot of work and this is i guess sort of one part of the change that now it's 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 tougher from the well, I would say it's tougher for the clubs that have established themselves as good venues for performance. Mm. But that again, that if you want to order like up and coming promoters, you always think about what you know, what would be the venue from the point of view of the cost. Club is more expensive. I'm gonna rent my own room. Mm. But then again, the question is okay. Even if you rent the space, that yeah, with the club, uh, I remember experience of um, the. The Grind Fest back in the day, 2010, I believe, something like that, or 2011, uh, where they sort of did the, the Grind Party, which, which still is popular, but mm. had just become like the new hotspot, and they were doing great. Hollywood was packed, and they decided to have a festival, which they did in near Paterno. But with that, I mean, that was the thing that you, at least I saw on the sidelines that it's one thing like you have you if you get used to the fact that i just show up to a specific location where i don't have to worry about security boss like yeah, everything is there yeah. i just come in you know put up my tech tech give a great party say thank you to everybody and i'm having a great time because as even if it's my party as a promoter i don't have to worry about whether or not I've ensured that, you know, we're going to have the bar staff. Yeah. Do they know at what time to show up? Have we paid the freaking bill so that we would have the electricity on? Stuff like that. And then when you move it, like, okay, I'm going to do it myself. And then at some point when you see that kicking in that, oh. Bar staff, uh, fridges, uh, yeah, well, but lights, that, sound, tech, security staff. All this. Yeah. How do toilets. I mark that? Toilet, yeah. yeah, classic toilets. How many toilets? You do Even all the, of that. Yeah. I think, I, I think when, I, when we were dealing with Privé, I think I naively had an attitude of like, dang, these guys charged up the wazoo for rent. Now, that wasn't for me. We had a pretty good deal because uh, we kind of had the stranglehold on stand-up comedy. So I could sort of work some ways in, right? But if you, just for, again, observing the back, the back office was that if you were a club, o- like a, a guy, a person trying to run a night and you, I'm going to try to make a particular brand of party in club privé. I was like, dang, these dudes take a fuck ton of rent from you. Fuck. They're hard asses. But in, pers- in retrospect, I get it a lot more now. You're getting the building. You're getting all of that. You're getting the credibility of Club Privé. Absolutely. Which is yeah. now maybe not so much a thing, but it was a huge thing. Oh, back then it was back a huge then, thing. right? Absolutely. That I was allowed yeah. into that venue even though I'm paying for it. That, yeah, I don't think I quite got it. So- It was the back context that people, mm. okay, you know, if, if, if it's good, if that event is good for the club, it already meant something. Yeah, so yeah. People who would come to Privé would expect, just like you said, they would expect certain level, mm. very high level of service, and they would know that if something is happening there, at least it's sort of, it has gotten over the threshold, the minimum threshold set by the club, the minimum that it has to be to be allowed in. So various, uh, uh, I guess, the, the progress now is, on a good side, yep, more is happening 
a lot of choice, but that always reminds me of the, the, the feeling I remember I had when I moved to Finland from Estonia and as a guy, a kid who was born in Soviet Union, grew up in the nineties, Estonia. For me as a student in Finland, I was always finding myself in those awkward situations where my course mates from Finland or wherever else places in the world would be like, oh my God, you know, I went to the shop yesterday. They did not have like some kind of special cheese. My dinner plans were ruined. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? Like no cheese at all. Like, no, they were all the other cheeses. <laughs> that was cheese. Uh, Great. And they're like, no, but I, you know, I needed that special cheese. I'm like, okay, I feel you. <laughs> I don't really feel your pain. I get the point you're saying, but you know, just, how about next time trying uh -huh. to work around the problem with some other cheese? So to me, for somebody who, well, growing up at a time where we sort of the, the choice was limited to the fact that cheese, no cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I was always laughing with, with a friend of mine who studied together that like if we would if I would have any of us would have gone to like if I would have not gone to my mom, like Mom, what do you mean you brought this cheese? <laughs> I'll do I fear it. no man if you're only one woman in this life. You would have freaking killed me. Like, you don't want cheese, you're not going to get cheese. You know, that's it. Which, okay, I get it. Again, cultural differences. But at some point, I guess now, it's with, with the choices, it's... Now, that was even tougher. Like, I remember when I started doing uh, stand-up with, with you guys and with Comedy Estonia, I still like get some people go, oh, you know, I remember they would do, would do those free shows in, in Telis Kivi outside in the middle on a, on a, on a big, big, like small stage and like a lot of people could come. I'm like, well, yeah, sure. But would you want to be the one, like, if you, every time you ask somebody, like, would you want to be the one, like, putting it all together? Uh, no. I'm like, see, <laughs> that's the thing. And, organization wise yeah. now that show was so good and so many people came like yeah we worked that out we decided to tell you motherfuckers sell you motherfuckers a ticket yeah yes <laughs> yeah. yes absolutely yeah <laughs> so because now again with, with with the different venues with the different parties this is always like to see the the comparisons where again somebody like if, if in stand up, some times at open mics, I always love those comparisons. Like, oh my God, I watched Kevin Hart yesterday. It was like so much more different, so much more better. Like you're comparing apples and origins here. It's, it's an open mic. You yeah. watch the rehearsed, re well written show, which obviously from this point of view was better. It was supposed, if it would have been worse, then maybe you didn't watch Kevin Hart. Who knows what happened? Mm. But now with, with events, it's again like certain venues closed back in the day, Kelm great mm. place um Sinilind, which is now sort of Kinomaya. Guess, Kinomaya, yeah, that that's really one. nice in Kinomaya. yeah have you been into it since it's been renovated i haven't been to the new you one. gotta go check it out like we w before the corona came along mm. we were gonna um we we're gonna put the next dissident live there oh cool. like it's real you know so the the whole the whole room has been moved 180 or th wait yeah 180 Wait, I'm trying to think of degrees. So the stage is no longer at that end, like mm -hmm. the big thing at one end. Where the bar was, that's now the stage. Oh, cool. At there. And so the garderobe is actually the backstage. And they've got nice screens. The floor has been done. There's curtains. It's legit. I feel super bad for Daniel Padre, who's running it. Like, mm. he's got this really nice venue, and we all can't have events now for the next three months. Like... Oh, it's cool because I, I remember the mm. old uh, Cinelint when it's sort of, I guess, yeah, that, what I love about that is back then I was had exactly the same thing that where the stage was mm. and what it is now, that's exactly how it, in my mind that would make so much more sense. Yeah. Because you would, lit you would come in. You want to go to the, the toilet, events. you've got to interrupt yeah, the show and, walking by the side yeah, there. Yeah, 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 not just that. It's number one. And number two, it was like, you would come in from the most illogical yes. place of them all. <laughs> like instead of literally entering like the building from the main door, yeah. you, you would come from the staff entrance, which mm. is, I mean, why not a cool idea? But you would literally, when coming, stepping into that party, you would be in a corner and then the, the first five minutes, like, okay, I have to get through the people to figure out what's going on here. 
And then if you pass this stage, then again, coming back even from the same toilet, you're like, okay, those guys on stage, I'm going to fuck it up twice. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'm going to the history books here. Right. And that stage was so high. Uh, yeah. And I felt like I was really dominating over people when I was there. It was a bit of a Hitler and- moment every time you were on that yeah. stage. Hi, like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of my people. And yeah. then you had to bring those extra lights. And yeah, so it's real, real nice. So it's really, really nice now. I really like, they've like clearly put money mm. into it. And- I mean, I guess they have, because the difficulty, and I'll say this, my own personal thing, the difficulty with that venue over the years, I, from my external observation, has been the owner, which is the Kinolite, who own that building. And they've been, again, I think tough on the people that have tried to rent it. And they've had very tough conditions so whoever the the manager who was when it was Cinelind, they were really tough, and they were like, "No, we want that day. No, go fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. You can't have the day for the party or do the event because we're Kinoli and we own it, and our conditions say that we can have it whenever we want it, and that's tough as as a, a oh, if sort of- you're running if you're renting a venue. So I can only imagine that. Uh, Daniel Padre has got some conditions. I'm purely speculation here that he got some conditions like, yo, I'm going to have to put thousands into renovating this. So we got to come to some better rental terms. You can't just come in here and have your movie screening for five people on any night of the week. But then Corona came along and no one's doing anything anymore. Anyway, This is, yeah. I mean, with with the Corona, it's, uh, I'm, been thinking about it here for the last couple of weeks. That, that, that on the one hand, the purely sort of from pure interests, mm-hmm. one might say that it is kind of the survival of the fittest business, anyways. But the reality is that everybody are fucked. Like yeah. there's there's no good solution, mm-hmm. nowhere to be taken. Why? Like if if you're a, a small like event organizer. Screwed. And yeah, I, I get the movement which which started in Scandinavia and now is like in Estonia. They don't ask for your ticket money back. Respect the performers. And I'm all for that. But the economic reality of the fact is that at some point, even the, the people who would love to support the culture, you know, mm. if you've been sitting at home for two months and there's no paycheck, you're like, okay. Yeah, they need that money. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah but okay, I, I'm not going to support the performance. I'm going to get maybe my, I don't know, 10 euros back, but at uh, least I can get something. I was going to say show. that that phenomenon came from Scandinavia. You're right. Because the first time I heard of that, so to fill people in, there is somewhat of a phenomenon or people trying to make a social movement that they're saying like, hey, if your event got canceled or something, just just don't ask for a refund. Let them have the money as a sign of, you know, g- strength to the event organizer. And that, I got to honestly say, never entered our minds until I was dealing with the Finnish ticket agency. And they said, oh, yes. Some, we've heard this is a thing. And I was like, who are these fucking Finnish people handing over the free money? Like it never dawned on me. And I don't mean bad. Like I just never expected it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, I'm right on behind the people. Cool. If you need a refund, get your refund. Yeah. Like, cool. Absolutely. Right on. Yeah. I'm not asking for your, you know, yeah. exactly what you said. We're all stretching for money right now. I don't think this is the way. I don't think asking for money is the way to, oh, help me out. I'm an artist. You know, there's so many artists that need help. So many that need it. And I I, I do think there's going to be a way that we can, I don't know, get some extra through this. We just haven't found it yet. But, you know, it's real nice. If people want to donate their ticket money, thank you. But we don't expect it. And if you need it, brother, go and use it for yourself. Because, I mean, this is is the sad reality what happened we well some might say it was unexpected though i mean the, the shit hit the fan early january so yeah. by march you could well you could say that it was to be expected that the changes are going to come but that is the truth that i mean this the plenty of artists can need help not just the ones who yeah. whose tickets already been sold but i'm speaking about those who have maybe not sold the ticket yet now it's the question i guess the the thing like i, I was thinking the, when the current time uh, when they issued the new orders, I, mm-hmm. 
I remember having the first show with Sander, like kicking <laughs> off the tour, then the, the energy, and you're like, oh, that's some great thing. And then a week later, you're like, fuck. This is tough. That, yeah. It's tough because we were just dealing with this today because we have rescheduled shows for May. Now, I, and now the question is, well, the question is then, first of all, will we be allowed to actually gather and put on that event in May? So if an event is sold out, We've moved it to the end of May, and I kind of think that we will be allowed to gather by the end of May. Now, the next few weeks, we'll probably get some clarity on that. And you can't, I, I can't, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being an optimistic event organizer. But then the other consideration I've got is what if we've got an event that we've now moved to the end of May, but it's only half full? And what's the, the next question I have in my mind is what's the consumer confidence going to be? What are the people going to feel like buying tickets? It's one thing to say like, I've got the ticket and the event's on and Yuri says, and we can all go out again. So I will go to Sander's show because I bought the ticket. It's another thing to say, I'm going to pay my money now when maybe I don't have money. Maybe I've lost my job. Maybe things are uncertain that I'll now buy buy a ticket to that event that's happening at the end of May. That's a separate thing. So I'm looking at that again, at looking at what we haven't sold in May. And then there's the extra level, which is could we possibly add any more shows in springtime? That's real tough. That's really difficult. I don't know what we're going to do about I, I hi my suspicion is that we won't be adding any more new Sander shows in spring and we'll just try to finish off what we've already got and then we may have some second leg of the tour in autumn. That's my suspicion. But I think that I'm trying to make the smaller steps possible at each stage. And two weeks ago when this first happened, the smallest steps possible were literally a day ahead. Mm. You know, it was that first crazy days, right? Now we can go a week or two ahead and, and see. I still don't think we really know what's going to happen with May. And I think we're going to have to wait to maybe mid-April to understand, okay, is this shit gone down? Have we contained it? Is it possible that we may be able to meet and allowed to do that? Maybe the borders stay closed. Fucking keep Martin Helmer happy. We'll close the borders, but we can still gather. I'm willing to go with Ekra. Look, I'm willing to go with Ekra if it means we can sell some Sander tickets, all right? I'm not above <laughs> I'm not above selling out to make sure that the business still works, okay? Fuck it. Uh, but I, I think now then rather than looking two days ahead, we're looking two weeks ahead right now. But, and th this is the, I guess for any, everyone, uh, ev ev everywhere everyone and for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, I'm absolutely with you that those who have tickets, it's like holding on to them unless you really mm -hmm. need the money. Sure. Absolutely. And those who don't have a ticket now, it's going to be extra tough. To Who's going to buy? Like, exactly. Yeah. It's, and not just who's going to buy, but the, the question now is that how long that uncertainty is going to last? Mm. Like even the, the, especially with, again, summer coming up. Well, we've still got the hard one, almost good part of this is that we've got the hard in Estonia. There's always the hard deadline of midsummer, mm -hmm. which is you can do whatever you want, work, 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 show, 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 tour, 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 tour lots of stuff going on, but the five days before midsummer, you're out. Mm -hmm. It's over. No one's doing events there. It's not happening. And then on top of that, no one's doing nothing for the next four weeks. It's this recognized dead zone. So what I mean is that let's say it all goes to shit. Let's say the coronavirus is really terrible and it now seems that May is off. You know, let's say that- if we didn't have midsummer, we'd be like, maybe we'll just reschedule them for July. Yes. And then maybe it continues, you don't know. But you can't schedule a theater event for July in Estonia. It's summer. Mm -hmm. So if we can't, we've basically got to anything we can do before midsummer. And then after midsummer, we can't do anything again until September. Oh, yeah. So, in some ways, that works to, for us in this situation. Because if they go, if Yuri says, that's it, fucking May is off, cancelled, you're all staying at home. 
we're like, cool. Our next option is September. Mm -hmm. In which case we're pretty, we're much more certain that shit's going to be better by then. So that's not even so bad because it's like, well, okay, we post, but we know that if we have to postpone again, it will be the last time we postpone because that'll be for September, October and- well, shit, if we're still locked up by September, October, then we're f- way no more fucks. fucked than a comedy yeah. show. Nah. Dude, we got to wrap. I think we should wrap this up real soon. We've been, this has been nice, man. I think we've been talking about the, I like talking about the yeah, events in town. It's been cool. It's been good. Well, thank you for coming in. I hope the video works out. <laughs> uh, but I got to, I got to drive to Tato right now. Oh, cool. Yes. As he says, as he puts his beer back. Good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Pop Pop, thanks for coming along, man. Thanks for joining, man. Thank, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Peace out.